Okay, welcome back. Welcome to Unit 3. The first two units have given us some background that we need so that we can now dive into some real semiconductor problems. The topic of Unit 3 is understanding how we compute the equilibrium concentrations of electrons and holes in semiconductors. Our first step towards doing that is to understand a quantity known as the Fermi function. So in order to think about this, let's go back to the isolated silicon atom and its discrete energy levels. We know that we have 14 electrons and that we fill them up in the various uh, SPDS orbitals associated with the various quantum uh, numbers 1, 2, and 3. Now, I could draw a line here and I could say below that line the states are mostly filled or all filled. Above that line, the states tend to be mostly empty, or if I go far above the line, completely empty. All right? There's no need to draw that line because I can simply put the 14 electrons in, but I could draw such a line, the, the dividing line between the filled states and the empty states. Okay, now that line will turn out to be very useful to us in semiconductors. So if we go to semiconductors, we have a band. Here's the density of states versus energy, top of the valence band, bottom of the valence band, bottom of the conduction band, top of the conduction band. Okay, We have seen how to compute the density of states. We're only interested in the density of states near the bottom of the conduction band because that's where the electrons are, and it goes as the square root of energy. We only need the density of states near the top of the valence band because that's where the holes are and that goes as the square root of energy. You know, they actually have more complicated shapes and go to zero at the, at the top of the band or at the bottom of the valence band, but that doesn't need to concern us. Now, we can draw a line and we can say below that line, and that line is going, we're going to call the Fermi level, it's sometimes called the electrochemical potential or sometimes called the, the, just the chemical potential. But below that line, the states will be mostly filled. Above that line, the states will be mostly empty. This is going to be an important concept. Where is the Fermi level in the semiconductor? It's going to be an important concept because there is a very simple equation that describes the probability, a number between 0 and 1, the probability that a state at any energy is occupied by an electron. That simple equation is the Fermi function. The zero here is to, is to remind us that this is valid in equilibrium. This is the probability that a state in equilibrium at an energy of E is occupied. It's 1 over 1 plus E to the energy minus Fermi energy divided by KT. Now, we can also compute this probability out of equilibrium. There's a way to do that. Uh, we won't be discussing that in this course. We'll, we'll mention it a little bit later in the course. but. For right now, this entire Unit 3, we're focusing on equilibrium where this equation applies. So we are, in this course, we aren't going to derive this equation. In a more advanced course, you would derive it. But it, it makes sense. Electrons like to occupy the lowest energy states, so it makes sense that uh, the states with low energy should be occupied, the states with high energy are less occupied. We want to get comfortable now with this expression, with this Fermi function. So if I plot the Fermi function versus energy, Fermi function goes between 0 and 1, the probability that a state is occupied. Um, if I plot this, if I look at this equation at very low energies, much lower than the Fermi energy, then this is e to the minus a large number, which is close to 0. So this is 1 over 1 plus 0, essentially. The probability that a state that has an energy way below the Fermi energy is occupied approaches 1. If I look at energies way above the Fermi energy, then this is e to a very large number. I have 1 over a very large number. The probability that a state is occupied goes to 0. If I look at a state located at the energy equal to the Fermi energy, then this is 1 plus e to the 0. 1 plus 1 is 2. So the probability that a state at the Fermi energy is occupied is one half. So that's what the Fermi function looks like. States below the Fermi energy have a small probability of being empty. States above 
the Fermi energy have a small probability of being filled. Now, let me flip that on its side and plot it again. This is the Fermi function versus energy. Here's our Fermi function. Uh, at the Fermi energy, the probability that a state is occupied, if a state exists, there may not be a state there, but if a state exists, the probability is one half. And there is some transition between one and zero that you can get just by plotting this function out. Now, what we'll find is that the width of that transition is determined by the temperature. You know, if I do a plot at a particular temperature, T naught, and get an expression that looks like this, if I increase the temperature, the width of this transition from high probability of being occupied to low probability of being occupied gets broader as I increase the temperature. As I cool the semiconductor down, the width of that region gets sharper. If I go to T equals zero, this becomes a step function. All the states below the Fermi level are filled. All the states above the Fermi level are empty. So temperature has this effect on the Fermi function, broadens that transition region. Now typically, we're going to ask ourselves questions like, given a semiconductor, where is the Fermi level? And we're typically going to find it somewhere inside the band gap for a very heavily doped semiconductor, it might get a little ways into the conduction band. For a very heavily doped p-type semiconductor, it might get a little ways into the valence band, but it will generally be somewhere here. So the states way up in the conduction band, they're above the Fermi energy, will be empty. The states deep in the valence band, way below the Fermi energy, will be filled all the time. Right near the bottom of the conduction band, there's a small probability that some states might be filled. Right near the top of the valence band, there's a small probability that some of the states might be empty. That's what gives rise to the holes and to the electrons in a semiconductor. Okay, so now let's apply this Fermi function to the conduction band. So here's my Fermi function. Here's my Fermi energy. Let's assume that the Fermi energy is located in the forbidden gap and the conduction band is above it in energy. So the probability that a state is occupied at the Fermi energy is one half, but there are no states in the forbidden gap, so there are no electrons there. The probability that a state in the conduction band is occupied, there is a small probability, and there are states in the conduction band. What we're going to discuss now is an approximation to this function that is, it is valid for semiconductors that are called non-degenerate. A non-degenerate semiconductor, a non-degenerate n-type semiconductor, is one in which the states have a small probability of being filled. So if I look at the conduction band way out here, the energy is much higher than the Fermi energy. My Fermi function then, I will have one over e to a large number. I can drop the one, bring the exponential up on top, and the Fermi function is about 1 over e to the Fermi energy minus the energy of the state. Kind of easy to remember, the higher the Fermi energy moves, the higher the probability that states in the conduction band are occupied. So the states have a small probability of being filled under this assumption that the states are well above the Fermi energy, which is the non-degenerate assumption. This is an approximation that we're going to make use of frequently as we work out semiconducting problems. Now, there's a similar approximation that we can make for non-degenerate p-type semiconductors. A non-degenerate p-type semiconductor, there will be a small probability that the states are empty in the valence band. So, if we look at the valence band, that's down here below the Fermi energy. The energy is much less than the Fermi energy, okay? So um, there's a small probability of being empty. What I'm going to be interested in now is not the probability that the state is filled, but I'm interested in holes. So I'm interested in the probability that the state is empty. I can compute 1 minus F naught, and I get this expression, 1 over 1 plus EF minus E over KT. Now, since the energies of interest near the top of the valence band are much less than the Fermi energy, uh, this is 1 plus e to a large number. I can drop the 1. I can make an assumption that the probability of the state being empty is approximately e 
to the E minus EF over KT. I can remember that it's E minus EF because the lower the Fermi energy, the more likely the states in the valence band are going to be empty. So this is an approximation that we use for holes in the valence band. It's just a way to simplify the, the uh, Fermi function and make the calculations easier. So it's a widely used assumption. So we are frequently going to talk about non-degenerate semiconductors. A non-degenerate semiconductor is one in which the states in the conduction band are always well above the Fermi energy, and the states in the valence band are well below the Fermi energy. So as long as the Fermi energy doesn't get too close to the conduction band or too close to the valence band, this non-degenerate assumption will be a good assumption to make. When we make that non-degenerate assumption, then the probability that a state, say, at EC is occupied is just E to the Fermi level minus conduction band, uh, bottom of the conduction band over KT. And the probability that a state at the top of the valence band is empty is just E to the valence band minus Fermi energy over KT. Okay, so Knowing a little bit about Fermi functions now, let's draw energy band diagrams and see if we can put the Fermi level in an energy band diagram. So here's my energy band diagram. If this is an intrinsic semiconductor, I know that there are equal numbers of electrons and holes. So I would expect the Fermi energy to be near the middle of the gap so that there's an equal probability of the states in the conduction band being filled and the states in the valence band being empty. Turns out it's not exactly in the middle. We'll see why later, but that's what, because the density of states in the valence band is slightly different from the density of states in the conduction band. Okay. Now, in general, if we see an energy band diagram with a Fermi level somewhere, we can, you know, our question will be, given the Fermi energy, you know, what is the electron density as a function of the Fermi energy? What is the whole concentration as a function of energy? Well, we know that the non-degenerate approximation says that the probability of states in the conduction band being filled is uh, e to the EF minus energy over KT. Most of the electrons are right near the bottom of the conduction band, near EC. So we expect the electron density to be proportional to e to the EF minus EC over KT. In the valence band, we're interested in the probability that the state is empty. We have a non-degenerate approximation to that. Most of the holes in the valence band are near the top of the valence band. So we expect the hole concentration to be proportional to E to the valence band minus Fermi energy over KT. And we'll work out the math and later on and we'll see that that is indeed the case. Okay, so a bit about the Fermi function. When we compute uh, carrier densities in the next lecture, we'll see how to make use of the Fermi function. The Fermi function is simply an expression that gives the probability that a state, if a state exists at that energy, the probability that that state is occupied in equilibrium. There are two key parameters in the Fermi function. One is the Fermi level, and the second is the temperature. Those two parameters affect the probability that a state at a given energy E is occupied. So in the next lecture, we will make use of this Fermi function as we begin to compute carrier concentrations in semiconductors.